Thank they, you, everything. Yeah. Okay, they, and on behalf of the students and on behalf my, of my department, institute, I really thank you. Thank you for everything. You have come from a long distance mm -hmm. and you spent a lot of time here. Yeah. And I don't know how you enjoy here, but. No, my pleasure. My pleasure. Okay. <laughs> um, but I think that this is a good institution. Mm -hmm. And students are brilliant. Yeah. Okay. No, I, I think you have great students here. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So, a lot of the data that I collected is at a synchrotron source, and I've used mm, about four different synchrotrons in my career. But the one that I use the most these days is in Berkeley, California. It's uh, UC Berkeley is right on the San Francisco Bay, and then there's a hillside behind the campus, and you go to the very top of the hillside, and there's a synchrotron there that's a very old building. Very crowded synchrotron, but uh, a lot of good science is done there. And it's, as far as I know, it's the only synchrotron that actually has a dedicated line to small molecule crystallography. The majority of the crystallography is, is uh, on proteins and that kind of thing. So the small molecule people don't usually get their own beam line, but they do at Berkeley. And um, incidentally, they also accept crystals from around the world. I can't tell you exactly how it works, but it's not impossible that you could send some crystals there, get some data collected by the scientist who is there, even, or even to me. And, um, but the scientist is there all the time. They do collect, and they don't charge either. I mean, if, you, if your project is accepted, they don't charge anything. But I don't know the details of that. Sorry. Um, let me just tell you a little bit about the synchrotrons. I'll tell you a little bit about the science that I've done there, just a little. And if there's extra time, maybe I'll show you another fun presentation. OK. So well, this is what I've found. Um, in Last year, there was an issue of Chemical and Engineering News that had a feature article on synchrotrons. So according to them, the, um, there's more than 60 synchrotron facilities worldwide. And some are in progress at being built. These are some of the countries that I know for sure have them, <coughs> but they're, yeah, they're all over. There's you know, European ones, Canadian, Australian, there's China, India. Somewhere in India, I think, but I'm not sure where. Where is it? Mm. OK. And then the first Middle Eastern one, which has been in progress a really, really long time, is finally finishing, I think. And it's in Jordan, and it's in collaboration with many other uh, Middle Eastern countries. So what do they provide? Why would you go to a synchrotron? Very high energy radiation, um, ranging from radio wave energies to x-rays. So it's what we call soft x-rays and hard x-rays. Um, everything's collimated in plane polarized radiation. Um, many, many international collaborations. When I go there, I see people from all around the world. So it's a really, it's a very uh, energizing place to be and see all these people from different countries. The, you know, the ones who are coming on paying a lot of money, they. They don't waste any time. They work all night long. They don't want to waste a minute of this x-radiation. It's valuable radiation. Um, it's very useful for small crystals, like I would say in the range of five micrometers, like 0 0.005 millimeters on up, you can do. Um, if it's too big, then you have to put in all these attenuators because the radiation is so powerful and so strong. You can do um, unstable materials, too, because you can collect a whole data set really fast. You, uh, can, use, you can do time-resolved structures. And so these are just a few of the kinds of experiments that go on. I didn't add lithography, but I saw a lot of lithography being done, too. So many applications, many, many applications. Now here's what the building looks like, like I said, it's on a mountaintop. From down below, it looks kind of like an orange dome. 
but it's beautiful up there. The, uh, I have another picture I'll show you of the view. This is, like I said, the only beam line in North Carolina dedicated to chemical crystallography. It's uh, called Beamline 11.3.1, so how we refer to it. The um, energy range is between 6 and 22 keV, which translates to 2 to 2.56 angstroms. Uh, currently, the detector they're using is a Photon 100, which is the next detector after the Apex 2 detector. But there is another Photon and uh, instrument detector since then, and they may transfer it to the new one soon, I think. So that's just called the Photon 2, I think. Uh, it should correct some of the errors that we're experiencing with this, but it's a CMOS detector. It, it's a new technology. All of the latest SLR cameras have CMOS technology. So it's really, it's replacing the CCD, and one of the reasons is um, it's, it's shutterless. You don't have to wait for the readout of the different frames. You can just continue. So you save maybe four or five seconds of frame that way. It goes really, really fast. Um, beam size is, is small. It's, it said on the article that I saw 0.2 millimeters, but I have a feeling it's actually smaller than that. And they actually do have a helium cryostat, so the range of temperatures you can use is between about 15 Kelvin and 500 Kelvin. Okay, here's a view. So looking out the entryway, you see the Bay Area, you see the Golden Gate Bridge, um, Alcatraz Island, and it's, it's, it's a spectacular view. Very, very nice. Inside the building, it's extremely cluttered. <laughs> this is just the particular beam line that's 1131, it's called a hutch inside there. And um, there's a whole lot of safety interlocks because it's, because it's such a powerful x-ray beam. You, you definitely don't want to get any exposure to it. But this is just one image. I mean, if you were there, you would be amazed at the number of experiments going on and the clutter and the amount of equipment that's everywhere. Uh, it's pretty impressive. <coughs> So I've also visited the beam line, and I didn't collect any data there in China recently. That was, um, it's, it's called SSRF, S Shanghai Synchrotron Radiation Facility. It's pretty new. It's only been there, I think, about five years. Um, the fellow on the left in this photograph is one of the beam line scientists. The woman next to me was my graduate student. And she is also a beamline scientist. So she was for a while at 1131, but she's recently moved to a different beamline called 1222, where they do high pressure crystallography. And so uh, when I go to the synchrotron, I see her. And then the fellow on the right is uh, a Chinese collaborator. So uh, compared to ALS, this is a brand new facility. It looks completely space age. It's absolutely beautiful. This is uh, something that was in their lobby when I was there, and I photographed it because it's actually an animated thing. Oh, wait, okay, let's see if I can get it to go. Oh, yeah, okay. So it's showing the electrons spinning circularly around this ring. So the um, the portion in the, in the middle here that is this working? I may have run out of battery. No, it should be working. Okay. This part right here is called a booster ring. And so the high energy electrons are uh, given a lot of energy almost to the speed of light. And this, because this is capable of repeating that over and over again. You never have any period of time when you run out of, ex of electrons. So from the booster ring, they're ejected into this outer ring. And then surrounding the outer ring are a lot of magnets. And the magnets keep the electrons going in a circle like that. And because they are forced to go in a circle, they also give off radiation in a tangential form out like this as they go around. And those those are what become the, what we call beam lines. So the electrons are then passing down these straight lines uh, and then into a little hutch 
where your defectometers or whatever are hosed, housed. Yeah. I have another uh, picture of that, just a diagram. So, oh, okay, there's one more. This is a rather large uh, synchrotron in Grenoble, France. I did collect some data there. It's just across the Swiss border, not too far from Switzerland. And I was in Switzerland for a few months. Okay, so here's, here's kind of the idea. So a booster ring accelerates electrons to nearly the speed of light, then injects them into a storage ring, and then the magnets keep the electrons in a circular path, and then the tangential beams are produced. And at ALS, for example, I think there are around 40 different lines that have different experiments going on. And this is, again, sort of a, a, just a description of what's going on. You've got the booster ring, the storage ring, and then beam line and end station. Multiple ones, though. With all kinds of different things going on. So what can you do if you are an X-ray crystallographer and you're interested in small molecule difficult structures? Well, one of the advantages is, of course, you can tune the wavelength. Absolutely tune the wavelength. It's not like you have to wait. You can just change it, and immediately it's available at a different wavelength. So if you increase the wavelength, you also spread out the diffraction. So like 1.5 angstrom wavelength is copper radiation, approximately, and you see the spots spread out on the, on the image. So here's a, a comparison. This is a, a fullerene with two uh, thuliums inside. And at our home source, we um, we're seeing some spots that were really close together, and we thought it was probably twinned. Um, not sure if you could see it yourselves, though. But right here, for example, there were two spots pretty close together. Here, those are pretty close together. Here, there's some close together. But they couldn't be resolved. And besides that, we couldn't really be sure of the unit cell, and the scattering was dropping off pretty fast. So this was when we took, uh, and these are 60 second frames, so one minute to get that exposure on our home source. Okay, now taking the same crystal to the synchrotron, mm, I'm sorry, that was, uh, I don't know where I got that image. Okay, so that's just circling some of the places where we thought there was twinning showing up. At the synchrotron, these are one second exposures. Um, now the unit cell was completely unambiguous, um, got a good twin integration, and we had used a wavelength which I don't remember at the moment, but it was, it was longer. So we were able to spread out the reflections, and then we got a resolution to about 0.5 angstrom's resolution. So that's, that's one of the reasons why we're interested in using the synchrotron. When you have these fullerenes that we have, you never have more than a milligram of material, if that. So you really have, you're stuck with the crystals that you have, maybe only two, three, four, five crystals, and that's it. That's all you get. So it's important that we can go there and choose a crystal, even if it's really small, but if it's a single crystal, or, or you know, whatever, twinned, but we can deal with it, then that's really valuable. All right, so. Over the years, we have published, our group that is from UC Davis, we have published more papers with synchrotron collections at UC Berkeley than anybody else. Um, so that, that's really good because when we go to write a proposal for more beam time, we get it. So just to brag a little bit, this was a, a highlight that was published by ALS of some work that we did where we were looking at fullerenes that looked like nanotubes. Um, so here's some you know, nanotubes and then comparison. These are fullerenes, but they have uh, an elongated shape and sort of approaching what uh, a nanotube would look like if it were capped. So that was a few years ago. And then periodically we've done these highlights. This was uh, what another one, if you went to my talk, I, I mentioned this structure, which was one that had a heptagon in the 
full rib cage, which is quite unusual. So this was just, yeah, we just finished this a couple years ago, this work. And that data was collected at ALS. All right, so I want to just mention another uh, recent experiment that we've carried out. If you co-crystallize C60 with S8, octasulfur, octa um, many, many structures have been published, but they were all at room temperature. And in every case, they described it as horribly disordered, and they got really bad carbon-carbon distances, and it was bad. But we found that if you cooled this crystal, it underwent an ordering transition, and going from so this is a photograph taken under the microscope. Um, from C2 over C to P1 bar, you've got a really nice structure. And I'll show you a picture of that in a sec. In addition, my student, Cameron, noticed that there were some other crystals in there. Some of them were needles that were sort of flat needles, so we call those laths. But there were some others that were more just needle-shaped. And he was... Um, observant enough to decide that maybe that was something different. And he picked one, put it on the diffectometer, and sure enough, you know, it, it had a different uh, space group and a different structure. It was also disordered, however, at room temperature, but when he cooled it, it became ordered and twinned and a different space group. So that's commonly what happens. It's an ordering transition accompanied by twinning. Anyhow, so now we have actually four polymorphs. So polymorphs are, by definition, structures that are structurally different, but with the same composition. So we call them polymorphs, even though they're just really at different temperatures. <laughs> so the first two were considered alpha, beta phase, and then I think that's how we did it. Yeah, gamma and delta phases. And um, this was published a couple years ago in Crystal Growth and Design. Let me show you what they look like. So the first one, which is the one that was already known, um, drawn with just one of the fullerene uh, cages, looked like this, the structure. So it was, they're all one to one, actually, uh, geometry, or one to two, sorry, composition. At low temperature, then it orders. <laughs> and you, you can probably tell that these are in different orientations. And that's typically what happens. This one was actually a superposition of two orientations. The com common thing that happens when you, you have uh, disorder in fullerenes. <coughs> the other one, the needle, at room temperature looks absolutely ghastly. It's so badly disordered. It's just a glob. But at low temperature, it orders, and it looks like this. So two, again, two orientations of the ball and four different uh, SA groups. Now, the reason we were interested in this in the first place was that some people have suggested there would be charge transfer from an S8 to a fullerene where the S8 becomes more positive and the fullerene becomes more negative. So we were hoping that we could see some evidence for that, but we didn't. Uh, we did see, though, that the sulfur is tended to kind of point toward the fullerene, but more it's really hard to say what's going on there. The um, geometry of the S8 groups was just exactly like pure S8. It wasn't like it was a crown confirmation. Nothing particularly unusual about it. Now, to follow this phase transition, what you can do, which is kind of fun, is to look for the disappearance of certain conditions or extinctions. So like, for example, let's see, I don't have the space groups written on this slide. On the next slide I do, though, I think. Yeah. So the first one is C2 over C. And at room temperature, or you know, in general, that space group is going to have an extinction that's due to the lattice. So for all HKL, H plus K is even. Okay. If you go down to P1 bar, there's nothing like that. So the the Reflections with the index of H plus K even will disappear. 
and of course you have to take into account the changes in the axes too. So there's some matrix algebra going on here. But it was pretty clear that as you, uh, yeah, at low temperature, these with H plus K odd are present, and at room temperature, those with H plus K uh, odd, odd are absent. Okay, so you can follow the change in space group symmetry. And the same thing with P21 over C and PC. In the P21 over C, those with those 0 K0 zero reflections are absent if K is an odd number. And so you can follow something like 0, 7, 0, and again, it drops off. And uh, it becomes absent high temperature, at high temperature, okay? Anyway, so that was fun. Then we wondered if, if you could actually induce some kind of interesting chemistry with this, if you could subject these crystals to high pressure, because people have proposed in the past that fullerenes were, will polymerize uh, under high pressure, and in some cases, maybe become super, con or not super conducting, but semi-conducting. And also we were wondering if the sulfur would form a bond with the fullerene. So now Christine, my ex-student, is at a high pressure beam line and she has access to the equipment to test this hypothesis. So just this past year or two, we've been trying to see what would happen. It's hard to um, interpret the results somewhat, but anyway, there's a picture of Christine and also of Cameron Gyasi who recently graduated with a PhD from my group. And so here, here was one of the proposals that we would get something like this happening. Could there be a bond between the fullerene and the S8? So here were some of the other things that we were wondering about. Could it polymerize, become a semiconductor, or anything like that? Well, the story isn't over yet, <laughs> but let me tell you a little about this experiment. There's something called a diamond anvil cell. Perhaps you already know about this. Um, each side of this cell, there's a diamond. And then in here is a, a area where you put your crystal. And it's in a fluid. And there's also a ruby in there. The ruby is used to determine the actual pressure, because ruby fluoresces as a function of different pressures. So it calibrates the pressure for you. Anyway, so you. You have your substance in here, and the crystal is sitting right there. And you can screw these two sides together to get more and more pressure. And be very careful you don't break the diamond. Um, and then, yeah, so this is what it looks like in the opening here, where the crystal sits, and there's, a ru there's some rubies there. Anyway, it's difficult to get full coverage with the diamond anvil there because it's going to block the reflections in a lot of different directions. So you don't get fabulous data like you would like to get, but good enough to solve the structure. So if you increase the pressure to about 4.7 GPA, we have both infrared evidence and crystallographic evidence that it's probably forming a dimer, which is what has been proposed in the past. However, there is always disorder, <laughs> because we aren't cooling it at this time. We don't simultaneously cool it and do the high pressure experiment. So unfortunately, looking at the disorder, it could be that instead of being a dimer, it's actually some kind of zigzag polymer, and it's really hard to be sure which it is. And um, I've interpreted it both ways and never convinced myself what's going on. If you increase the pressure, structure looks like this. So <laughs> it's definitely causing, it, if it is a dimer anyway, it's causing it to be kind of collapsed. The, the ball is being collapsed under pressure. So you can't just indefinitely increase the pressure, that's for sure. It looks like it's been smashed. So yeah, we're still looking at this experiment to see if we can get any better data. And um, of course, technology keeps changing, so they're getting some better instrumentation. We'll see what happens. But anyway, uh, this is something else that you can do with crystallography is, is see what happens at high pressure. There have been examples where 
actual chemical reactions take place by increasing the pressure. At this particular beam line, the, uh, most of the scientists are geologists, and they're interested in studying what happens in the deep earth where there is high pressure. So there's a lot of that going on, competing with us who like to do this kind of thing. <laughs> okay. So the conclusions on that part of the experiment are uh, at, low, at low pressures, like 2.6 GPA, we think we do get a dimer. And IR measurements indicate that too. Um, both of them are highly compressible. So there's really an amazing loss of volume when you get the unit cell dimensions. But the S8 conformation doesn't seem to change very much. And they become amorphous at pressures greater than 8 GPA. So just because we get nice ordering at low temperature doesn't mean we get nice ordering at high pressure. It's not necessarily related. OK, so that's just one little tidbit of science that we've done at the synchrotron. Um, this, I only mention this because well, you'll see why I mentioned this. This wasn't actually done at the synchrotron, but one of our collaborators, uh, Luis Echegoyen, and his group at UT El Paso sent us this bis adduct of C70. So it's a C70 with two anthracenes uh, attached, having gone a 2 plus 2 cyclo addition to the, to the cage. And that's showing you there one part of the structure. Interesting crystallization, too. It was done in the, in the melt by melting anthracene and mixing it with C70. OK, and they got a high yield. It's pretty amazing. The packing is so cool. It looks like this. So I call this shape compatibility. And we're seeing this over and over again with fullerenes, that they, they're compatible with porphyrins and with other curved molecules and so on. But the structure was particularly attractive. I liked it a lot. Shortly after I did this, this is really amazing to me anyway, I was with my grandson, who was only six at the time, and he was playing with goldfish. Do you know what goldfish are? These crackers that the kids love, the cheesy crackers. And he was doing this on the desk. <laughs> so, um, I mean, he hadn't seen that picture, but it's just nature, isn't it? Just to like symmetry, to like things to fit together, we enjoy these things, and it starts at a very young age. Isn't that amazing? So he's already on his way to becoming a young scientist, right? <laughs> Actually, he is, he's eight now, and he's already using computers and doing coding and stuff. <laughs> so they start young. Um, OK, so here's a, another picture from the ALS beams. Uh, facility as the sun is setting, because you're looking out toward the west, and the sunsets are incredible. And I don't know if you can see it, but they also have wild turkeys. So instead of having wild peacocks, we have wild turkeys. <laughs> and they run around the parking lot there, completely oblivious to the people, and they're just doing their own thing. And they also climb into trees at night, clumsily, but they do get up there. All right, so, so we do have a little time. I'll show you this other fun thing, which I think you'll enjoy. There is a crystallographer who is at the uh, University of North Carolina who collects stamps. And he likes to collect stamps of crystals and structures and crystallographers. And he gave this presentation at a meeting a couple of years ago. It was a couple hours long. Uh, it took just a selection of his presentation to show you. So let's see if I can bring that up. Friday. OK, this is just this short version. Many countries have published very beautiful stamps dealing with crystallography. I think I probably showed you this picture of Max von Laue. And there are lots and lots and lots of stamps with him on the cover. Different countries all around the world. A 
There's supposed to be a diffraction pattern there in the right. What country is that? You know? I'm not sure. It's a Latin language, it looks like. But I'm not sure where it is. Anyway. Then there are lots of mineralogical ones because of course those crystals are so dramatic and so pretty. <laughs> there you have a volcano in the back. Miners in the front. And then there's many, many versions of the Braggs as well. A lot, of, a lot has been written about them. Father and son. Here's some of them. I mean, there's more. It's, it's amazing. You see the one on the bottom left showing one of the alkali halides. Maybe it's sodium chloride, I'm not sure. OK, so then there's a lot of minerals. <clears throat> this isn't a stamp, but notice it's, it's pointing out the crystallization of sugar being known to ancient Indian. And of course, we know that that's true. And they still make these beautiful crystals of sugar that I've seen in the restaurants mixed in with with, I think, is anise, isn't it? You walk out the door and you get a handful of anise and sugar crystals. It's not salt, it's sugar. It's sweet. Yeah. Here's salt. Some more minerals. So, so you know who these folks are? Watson and Crick? Mm -hmm. Structure of DNA. If you haven't read the book that James Watson wrote that's just called The Double Helix, you might pick it up and read it. It's pretty fun to read. Hmm? Yeah, so Watson, yeah, he was, he was quite a character. And probably you've, you've heard of the controversy with um, Rosalind Franklin, who was actually the crystallographer and had already, I realized reading the book, and I'm sure a lot of people don't, that she had already figured out from the Patterson map what was going on with the double helix, but she didn't tell them because they kind of ignored her and they, they were mean to her for a while until they realized that she really knew something. But without her, they never would have gotten the structure. And it's too bad that she died before the Nobel Prize was given because she should have received one too. She should have been in there. So let's go back. Snowflakes, of course, lots of snowflakes. Here you don't get to see the snow, but in the mountains where I can go, when it snows, if you put some black cloth out, or black velvet or something like that, and if the snowflakes are nice and big, you can actually get beautiful pictures just with your cell phone of snowflakes. And I have done that. So ruby snowflakes. all in hexagonal form. OK, so Rosalind, then she did also get on um, this. No, she didn't get on the stamp, even. <laughs> Watson and Crick and Wilkins. Wilkins was the so head professor there at the time. OK, lots of DNA. So Max Perutz did one of the first actual crystal structures of a protein, and who also got a Nobel Prize in chemistry. There are more Nobel Prizes in crystallography-related areas than any other. So Max Perutz, big name. Dorothy Hodgkin, 
you all should, who study porphyrins, you should know about her work because she did the structure of vitamin B12, which is basically a porphyrin structure. And I actually met her a long time ago. Here's what she did. Those are the days where you had to actually interpret an electron density map. So over the past few years, there have been a lot of sort of international years of crystallography because it's around 100 years since crystallography started. So there are a lot of stamps commemorating that time. I'm not sure I knew all of them. Here's another woman who got a Nobel Prize, and she did work on ribosomes, which had successfully happened before her. And this, this fellow, Dan Schechtman, did crystallography on what are called quasi-crystalline materials. So the quasi-crystals are sort of like modulated structures. Sometimes they have five-fold axes, which uh, at one time people said could never happen, that you could have a five-fold axis, but you can actually. It's just that they're special. And he was the first to describe those. Okay, so this was the this is the group of the man who made the slides for this presentation, not my group. Um, being that he is originally from Chile, he actually, and he's Spanish speaking, he has a lot of students from South America. And he takes them hiking in the mountains in North Carolina. And this is his name, Daniel Rabinovich at University of North Carolina. So it's kind of a neat hobby, I think, that he has. If I ever see a good stamp, I'll send him one. He doesn't have very many from the U.S., so what's wrong with that, you know? What's, how come our, post, our U.S. post office doesn't have any good crystal? I'll send them an image sometime. Maybe they'd like it. Okay, so that's, that's the end of that slideshow. And that is the end of our class. So, <laughs> namaste. <laughs> Thank you. It's been really fun. Enjoyed it a lot. So I hope it was good for you too.